Welcome back to the Student Hub Live event for the Open University Business School. We've been having a fascinating discussion on the impact of globalisation on technology in business and society. And we've been taking a look at how mobile phone technology has had a massive impact in African regions. Um, and now we turn um, to look at Asian countries. Um, so I'm joined uh, to talk about the difficulties of economic integration um, between Asian countries um, with uh, Wilfred Manuela Jr. Welcome. Um, Peter Bloom who is joining us new, hot from London uh, at another <laughs> talk, um, and Devendra, Kud uh, Devendra Kudwani as well. Um, now, you're a visiting fellow here at the Open University, Wilfred, um, and so I'd like to focus on, on this initially because you've had a, a huge sort of... Um, uh, well, deep understanding, really, of, of some of the impact of globalisation on, on countries in Asia. And we've been talking a little bit about the various inequalities and economic differences between some of those countries, um, particularly between countries. So I wonder if you could introduce us to your perspective on, on why this matters. I would discuss the ASEAN region, which is composed of 10 nations. Um, so we are doing this economic integration because as a, as a group, we can actually be more successful as a trading block in the global economy than if we were to do it uh, one country at a time. So these 10 nations would become the third largest economy in Asia after China and Japan. So as a huge trading block, we would have more opportunities to, to, uh, to harness in the, in the open economy so that uh, we can get the best deal out there, the most benefit from globalization. And, and the focus of this economic integration is to allow the lesser developed nations in the group, in the 10 nation group, so that they can also grow their economies at a faster rate. Uh, because without this trading block, uh, they would not have these opportunities where they can have a bigger market for their products and services. Uh, Dev and Peter, you're both, um, well, you do a lot in um, economics. Um, what are some of the issues that you could see, I guess, from a more theoretical perspective about this idea that, you know, we, we're after some sort of standardisation, some sort of upskilling of countries that maybe don't have those assets or skills um, right now so that you've got a bit more of a level playing field? In, in our block, you know, in the UK as, as part of Europe at the moment, um, things are a lot more level in terms of that economic yes. integration, but there are a lot of complexities when there are these inequalities. Yes, there are. I mean, within the society, within the economies and between the economies, there are uh, issues. So one of the issues that I have studied uh, as part of uh, comparing the economies and why some of the practices and approaches that support economy work in one set of countries, such as let's say Europe, and don't work in another set of countries, let's say in Africa. So one of the th things we've been studying is institutions. Now institutions for economy for supporting business development uh, are regulations, corporate governance regimes, and so on. So one of the questions that has occurred in my research is, are the institutions compatible? And is ASEAN also going to face some of those challenges as a region? So when we looked at, say, corporate governance uh, in Africa, we looked at Cameroon, Ni Nigeria, South Africa, and uh, Kenya. And what we found that they took more or less the European OECD type of corporate governance framework as a regulatory system to improve the accountability of corporate boards in Africa. Uh, so you have board of directors, executive directors, non-executive directors. Intention is that they utilize the funds in the interest of their key stakeholders, which are generally assumed to be shareholders in Anglo-Saxon countries. But whether they are the key stakeholders in those countries is a question. So we were interested in finding, are these institutional differences important enough that would actually deprive the country or economy to benefit from some of those reforms in the governance sector? And we found something very interesting. So the corporate governance system requires that you have, let us say, balance on the board of directors executive, non-executive directors, male, female, and diversity in the board. What comes out is that when you take these systems, 
institutions and try to transplant them in the emerging markets where apart from the economic disparity that is easily measurable that you say okay they will benefit but there are local cultural issues there are customs traditions the role of uh, relationships how society sees how society relates to business so in kenya for example when we were studying they literally took uk's corporate combined code tried to implement it in kenya in 22 2002 and expectations from that were not only just to improve the corporate performance but also was to to realize some social and um, you know ethnic equality kind of objectives were built into the governance system but that was actually problematic because a you need enough critical uh, talent pool in the society who is educated and interested in governance of business and they then may or may not be in those tribes and and the ethnic groups that you are trying to balance their you know affirmative agenda so we found this conflicting result that when you try to derive the social benefits out of some institution which is actually meant for economics then you don't necessarily deliver through those so you have to have adaptation at the local level so i don't know will from whether similar things would prevail in southeast asian countries also well in asean uh, the disparity in economic development between countries uh, is really huge we have singapore which is yeah. one of the richest nations per yeah. capita wise you know and then there are a few countries in the asean that are probably in the either upper lower income or lower middle income so the disparity would actually create more inequalities once uh, economic integration sets mm-hmm. in because the industries of these countries may not be prepared for the more intense competition that result from from economic integration yeah. and one of these um, industries with the air transport industry mm-hmm. because uh, transportation facilitates global trade and and intertrade among asian countries or intra trade within the region would also benefit from a single aviation market yeah. not just the movement of goods and services as well yeah. but also the movement of people yeah. especially the tourism sector will have a huge boost from from a single aviation market so yeah. but because of the of the difference in infrastructure in air transport and because of the size of the domestic market as well so there are countries that are quite reluctant to to fully implement yeah. the 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 things that they need to do to to achieve this single vision market mm-hmm. yeah. and these countries would be Indonesia Philippines mm-hmm. i think you also see <clears throat> in this regard i think this picks up on Dev's point um and Wolfer's point but also about that there's a political relationship that goes just also beyond the institutions and i yes. think What's interesting about Asia is that it's a very uh it's in a very innovative place in terms of globalization. So I mean the dynamics of things that are happening for instance in South Korea, I mean the economic practices there go far beyond anything that's happening um with possibly the exception of some places in Scandinavia and Europe. So you have on the one hand huge amounts of innovation happening in terms of different ways in thinking about the economy process and innovation um the other part of that is the fact that you actually have quite a bit of capital even in underdeveloped countries so mm-hmm. philippines doesn't have a huge capitalization problems like you see sometimes in africa mm-hmm. um but it's an infrastructure problem the other though uh component though and I, and i think when you're looking at the integration parts is then saying what kinds of leverage is this going to provide so singapore which is a very rich country um in many ways one of the key parts that it has found is that it doesn't actually have an extraordinarily amount of strong leverage in actually changing what can be quite unfair kind of restrictions from the global north right um and this is becoming increasingly important because china has made it clear that they see their economic model and i think this is something we can speak about as something that they'd like to export they see that uh they see that region as a region in which they would like whether they're going to work with ASEAN or not be the spokesman for it uh China has made it also quite clear that because of their economic pow- prowess that they are no longer going to accept kind of dictates like they previously had from Europe and the United States and that they're going to work with BRIC countries in a transnational relation to say what would be a quote unquote better deal 
mm. for countries. So how ASEAN would then deal with that and the fact that you have a variety of different countries within that who have different, their own kinds of networks and own kind of special relationships. I think in addition to that, one of the problems that you've seen in Europe is that even though you have relative economic equality in comparison, you still see problems of internal colonization oh, yeah. quite strongly. And so how would you stop one of the biggest problems in Europe, which is the brain drain? Huge amounts of investment in things of nationally, things of education in places like Spain, Italy, and Greece that end up going to richer countries. Mm -hmm. Or how would you deal with the fact that, I mean, you have a country like Indonesia that has quite a bit of political power, but quite a, a troubling, let's say, history of economic management. Very similar to the UK. The UK has a lot of political power, has been very problematic in terms of economic management since the 80s. How have they overcome that? The EU has effectively subsidized them in ways that it hasn't subsidized countries that don't have as much political power. Well, the same thing happened there, where Indonesia might, for instance, get a huge amount of breaks mm -hmm. that places like the Philippines weren't. So I think these are all kinds of power dynamics that are very, in terms of local adaptation, but are things that are more broad as well yeah. and that are worth looking at. I, I, if I take a integration challenge in the aviation sector, for example, mm -hmm. so the two institutions that matter that need to converge in a sense for the aviation market to become a more vibrant and connected in the region is ownership of aviation industry and the regulation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have 10 countries, five of them fix the regulatory system mm -hmm. so that markets can operate seamlessly, mm -hmm. five don't. So if you have regulatory discon you know, divergence, mm -hmm. that will be a institutional barrier or if you have sometimes the ownership barrier. So suppose the largest ownership, the largest uh, fleet owned in the region is a public enterprise. Mm -hmm. They will be subject to very different set of strategies, uh, you know, than let us say five privately owned uh, companies in the region. So the two institutions of ownership <laughs> and regulation, if they don't converge or have a, um, a mutually dependent relationship sorted in the region, even aviation industry. So these are the kind of challenges I feel which are quite important uh, for a block to really thrive. Yes. A related issue would be like uh, the state-sponsored airlines, you yes. know, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, they may not be state-owned, but they're sponsored by the, yeah. by the countries that where they operate in. Yeah. And in the Philippines, we have liberalized uh, the ownership of these airlines so that mm -hmm. today, the government does not have any holdings mm -hmm. on these countries, except probably through government pension funds mm -hmm. that invest in the mm -hmm. stocks of these airlines. Other than that, we don't have a direct government ownership of these airlines. Then you look at other countries in the ASEAN region where the state owns the airline, yes. Yes. And, and that would put it in a, at an advantage against the airlines yes. who would compete in that mm -hmm. in that area yeah, because you have a tax taxpayer subsidized airline yes. <laughs> competing yes. against the shareholder owned airlines that's actually mm -hmm. a big issue now when yeah. through the ratification of the single asian market because yeah. Yeah. some publicly owned airlines um, will not compete well with state owned airlines because mm -hmm. of this cross subsidies yes. from the state yeah. Well, you asked our audience, um, Wilfred, um, whether or not technological advances benefit everyone. Um, so on that basis, governments should provide the necessary infrastructure and policies to facilitate the adoption of these new technologies. Um, let's see what everyone at home said. So a large amount of people um, were verging on the agree side um, to this question. Um, and we were also asking about, you know, who is benefiting. Um, regional economic integration invariably results in greater prosperity among the member countries. And most people agreed um, on that scale. And people for more likely to agree that they felt optimistic about the future, about how globalisation impacts on their countries and workplace. Um, and it also brings more benefits to uh, the developed countries compared to the non-developed, which we, we have discussed and a lot of people were agreeing with that. But I know that Zach has some questions as well. Yeah, we've got um, a load of chat going on. Um, some really good comments about uh, the, how technology um, is, is, is making sure that the infrastructure in less developed uh, countries is being taken into account. We've also got a, a comment, a question from Helen, who said that what is the impact of Western outsourcing of labour having on technological development in emerging economies? Okay. In the Philippines, uh, one of the biggest industries now is the business process outsourcing. <laughs> it is employing a lot of Filipinos coming out of college. Even those without college degrees can now find good paying jobs through the sector. But the problem of this uh, industry is, probably, uh, is that uh, uh, 
it may not last because uh, these companies would just be looking for the cheaper, you know, inputs to their production yeah. system so that if the Philippines become expensive, yeah. then they would have to move to a, a, a cheaper country. So the problem now for the Philippines is to, to have an economy that is less dependent on these mm -hmm. foreign direct investments, you know, mm -hmm. so that it can create an economy that is more resilient when, when these investors pull out their money and put it in a cheaper uh, mark, uh, labor market. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, in theoretical terms, it is a fascinating development. If you see Ricardo's comparative nations advantage, uh, comparative advantage of nations theory. So I think that was a theory built in, you know, time when knowledge was not globally distributed or easily distributed. Yes. So if you look at that, ap apply to Indian outsourcing, which preceded, say, uh, Asian countries coming yes. in, Filipino. So uh, assumption was, OK, Indian IT labor is uh, more economical than American and European IT labor. So let's go and set up our outsourcing and call centers and all that there. And then their, their wages went up. Uh, of course, the East Europeans started learning English. So they are competing in the same space. Filipinos are competing yes. in the same place. So what does it prove? It shows that the comparative advantages in the knowledge economy mm. are for a short duration of time. They are yes. not like permanent comparative advantages of nations. So for a country or a region to build up a lot of infrastructure, so if you were going to train, if Chinese decide we have a lot of people, we will train them in English and then flood the market with the IT professionals, and they come out with 100 million trained people in 10 years' time. But then at the same time, other countries are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's a, so I think it's an organic um, comparative advantage rather than the static comparative advantage. Like, mm -hmm. I cannot have oil in UK mm -hmm. or in Europe because <laughs> that's in Middle East. It is in okay. Middle East. But knowledge is something which you could develop. Talent it's a is distributed something. system then. So that, it is a very interesting theoretical issue. Now, what is the comparative advantage of nations? What would be that? Well, I think you also have to look at how this plays on path-dependent behavior that happens. Mm -hmm. Because one of the, the I mean, the, and I think was telling that was a really good question in the sense that it's not just a comparative advantage, which is extremely important and it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's also the ways in which then they focus on technological infrastructure development mm -hmm. and which technologies are focused on. So it's, it's extremely interesting. I mean, in a place like India that has, on the one hand, some of the best and brightest kind of technical universities, technical schools, and some of the most interesting mm -hmm. technical innovations, you've also seen massive technological investment, which is essentially on IT services, yeah. Yeah. which you would think to yourself, well, that doesn't make a whole lot, a, a range of sense, but it makes sense in terms of the fact you're kind of chasing that small market. I think you're seeing a similar aspect in countries in Asia. So you have a country like South Korea, which I said, well, we're not necessarily going to chase that market, mm -hmm. right? Because we actually want to have sustainable infrastructure development. And it, this is really important when we think about this. There's a personnel and there's a tech, uh, there's a personnel and there's a structure side. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I mean, just like in the military terms where, you know, Western militaries sell Middle Eastern countries, uh, you know, the second best option. It's the same common kind of process here. We sell you the second best technology. Mm -hmm. And a lot of countries are saying, well, we don't want that anymore. We want to develop our own technology. We want to create our own technological mm -hmm. infrastructure. Um, and we want it to compete. But the other side is the personnel side. So it's interesting what China's going to do in terms of ASEAN, because this is what they've done in terms of Africa, which is said, we'll help you with your infrastructure. We'll help invest as foreign direct investment in terms of your technological infrastructure. But we're not going to give you the technology, and we're not going to give you the personnel. Mm -hmm. We refuse to train you in that way. What we're going to do instead is send our people over, because we don't have that. Now, South Korea and India has said, we can't compete with you on capital terms, but we can compete with you on intellectual property terms. Mm -hmm. What if we gave you the technology? What if we gave you the codes? What if we gave you things? And actually, then you could build more organically mm -hmm. your technological infrastructure. So these are huge things that are happening because of this. But I think what Wilfred is right is that I think with something like integration, ASEAN and Asian integration, there's really going to be strong things of saying, can richer countries support poor countries and not just chasing this you know, dynamic comparative advantage. Mm. And will they be willing to do that? And will poor countries be willing to get their institutions, quote unquote, right? And I don't mean that in a World Bank way, I mean that in a more fundamental way, mm. in order to allow for that kind of long-term planning and investment. 
So I think these are serious questions that we have to think about in terms of that. The ones that we certainly can't address uh, no, <laughs> completely in a very no. short session like this. But um, thank you very much. Let's end this session. Our next session is on futures. Um, and, and Peter, I'm sure you'll have a lot to contribute, as will you and Wilfred. And we'll, we'll bring back Ian into that final session also. Um, but, but thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and we're going to have a short video break now where we're going to um, take a po profile look at Peter Bloom. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes um, for our final session, um, which is about um, uh, futures. So I'll see you in a few minutes.